Uh, Queenie is over 10 years old, and uh, she has been described by legal directories as being incredibly bright and uh, being consistently on top of the details of her cases. And in this session, Queenie will be sharing with us exactly how she has always been on top of her files and her cases, uh, as this session is titled Effective fi a File, Time and Stress Management uh, for Advocates. Queenie, a very warm welcome to you, and thank you very much for sparing the time to be with us this evening. Um, could I ask uh, for you to tell us about yourself and your practice as well? Sure. Well, thank you so much for having me, Greg, and everybody else in your firm. It's very kind of you. It's really my privilege um, to be able to chat to you this evening. Um, I'm, I'm sure you're all very um, experienced advocates, so I'm sure this is more about just sort of sharing anecdotes from, from my practice and life, as it were, but I'm, I'm more than happy to do that. So just a little bit about myself. Um, as Greg mentioned, I'm now at Temple Chambers in Hong Kong. Um, I actually started off as a solicitor at Slaughter in May um, before becoming a barrister. And for me, it's definitely uh, the right decision. Um, in terms of what work I do, I do civil as opposed to criminal. Um, and then I do both litigation and arbitration. Um, and I was just saying to Greg, um, I was very pleased to find that one of your um, partners, um, Sudar, was actually my expert in one of my arbitrations. Um, though sadly, the, the case uh, settled just before the substantive hearing. So I didn't get to see Sudar in sort of full action, as it were. But um, in terms of practice area, I do a sort of general commercial, um, regulatory work, uh, professional negligence, employment, um, defamation, uh, all sorts. I think because the market in Hong Kong is quite small, so we tend to specialize a lot less than in places um, like England, for example. Thanks for that, Queenie. Why choose advocacy? I think um, for me, I just like talking <laughs> in a nutshell. Um, and I think having been a solicitor first, because in Hong Kong, um, like England, um, there's a sort of divide between uh, the two professions, um, solicitor and barrister. And uh, solicitors generally do less oral advocacy. Um, and, and so I found that when I was um, in Slaughter in May, uh, it was very fun in many, many ways. And I learned a lot, um, but I found I missed, um, actually, I think I missed both the legal research um, because um, the sort of really black letter law stuff, um, we tend to give that to barristers more than solicitors. And so I missed both that and the oral advocacy. So really um, the chance to persuade people, I think both in writing and orally um, is just something I really enjoy. Sure. Queenie, could you tell us um, a, or describe to us a typical uh, weekday for you that involves a court attendance? Yeah, um, usually um, I get into work at maybe seven something. So usually before eight. Um, and I like uh, going downstairs uh, for coffee in a coffee shop um, and, and do a bit of reading. And I, when I say reading, I mean non-law reading, so something else. Um, I find it helps to kind of have a quiet start to the day rather than lurching into all the craziness. Um, and then I'll come back up and probably do a little, little bit of last minute uh, rereading um, before the court hearing. Um, the court hearings in Hong Kong usually start at nine, either 9.30 or 10, depending on the type of hearing. It might last um, half a day or a day. Um, and after the court hearing, I will have to continue sort of picking up emails and um, dealing with other deadlines. Um, so that would be a sort of typical day for me. Right. Uh, do, you, do you find you usually work at nights or do you normally stop work once you leave the office, once you leave court? Oh, um, I definitely don't stop work after leaving court. Um, I, I tend to sleep at maybe midnight. So um, if I'm free, then I might sort of go out for uh, sort of dinner with friends. But if, if I'm not really free, then I'll just have to carry on working until um, later. But uh, speaking for myself, I tend to rarely work before, uh, sorry, rarely work um, beyond uh, midnight. Right. I tend to be more of an early person. Okay, okay. Queenie, could I take you to a time when you have first received a new brief? Uh, yeah. Could you describe to us the, the few things that you do to get up to speed with the matter after yeah. receiving a new brief? Yeah, thanks. Um, usually the solicitors will have sent me um, a, a sort of summary in either an email or, or a letter. And so usually I find that uh, as a, a useful uh, starting point. And then um, hopefully they will have highlighted or I will have to work out for myself, which are the key documents to read. And then usually I will try and uh, start with those. 
And as I go along, I'll probably jot down uh, some sort of legal points um, or, or factual matters that I need further instructions on. Um, so I'll usually try and get do that relatively quickly as a as a sort of overview, first of all. OK, and, and how do you prioritize your tasks to ensure that your cases are effectively managed? Um, to be very honest, um, because I'm quite busy, I'm quite um, sort of deadline driven. Um, so the reality is I need to see uh, what I have to do at what time. Um, I do actually personally keep a to-do list um, on my computer, which I keep adjusting. So I have different sections, um, like what I need to be doing, um, what I have given to my leader, and I'm waiting for my leader to come back to me on. And then also thirdly, um, what I'm waiting for a more junior person to give to me. And then I have to look at all the deadlines and try and juggle um, those three lists. Right. And, and do you usually work in a team or, or is it just you working as the barrister? On the trial? Um, for, for barristers in Hong Kong, um, how we work or not work in the team depends very much on the case, case by case basis. Um, so essentially depends on how much um, sort of how big the case is, how many issues, how much uh, sort of papers there are. And um, and also, of course, uh, the budget <laughs> of the client. So sometimes I will have um, a leader above me, like a senior counsel. Sometimes I will have a junior junior uh, helping me um, when I'm very, very lucky. I may have both um, a leader above me and a junior junior below me. Um, so it just depends. Uh, and, I, and for me, I quite like um, these different roles, actually, because in, in, in these different types of teams, if I can call it that, um, my role is always slightly different. Um, so when I'm the junior, for example, um, then I would not be doing the oral advocacy. But then usually that would be a more complex case where uh, the legal issues, et cetera, will be uh, more uh, sort of difficult and more interesting. Um, and then my leader will do the oral advocacy. Um, whereas if I have someone below me, um, that person can do uh, the research or first drafts of documents, um, but then I will still need to look over those and work on those and also um, handle the oral advocacy. So I enjoy the variety. Oh, ordinarily, in, in briefs, when you are led by a senior, um, who, who is it that um, usually uh, defines the tasks to be done to prepare for the case? Is, ah. is it a senior or is it yourself? And um, usually it'll be the senior sort of in sort of discussing it with me and then we kind of decide how we do it. But usually um, there's also a kind of general rule. So, for example, for skeletons, it will always be the junior who does the first draft. Um, so there's a kind of and for example, advisors, again, I would do the first draft. Um, so that, that's kind of quite um, sort of usual. But then for I guess the most uh, sort of the, the more unusual things, then we would discuss it and ultimately it will be for the leader to decide. Sure. Um, when, uh, when working in a team, do you think the delegation of tasks is crucial in uh, ensuring that the case is effectively prepared for? And if the answer to that is yes, to what extent do you delegate? Um, I have to say I, I, it's a learning process for me as well, um, because it's only really in recent years that I've sort of started being in the seniority where I have people below me helping. Um, and so for me, it's also an art to learn how to kind of encourage that person to be their best and to help the case um, as effectively as possible. So as I learn to do that, I think it is becoming more and more effective. And I think also um, in reality, um, although the different uh, way, the, the sort of different barristers on each team will vary from case to case, I will also um, have some people I work more with. And so especially um, with those people, then we will have a very good um, kind of understanding as to you know, what I expect, what I'm hoping for, and, and then we will all know how to help each other um, well. So I think um, that does help the case very much. But, uh, how, how, how do you identify the tasks that can or, or should be delegated to a junior? It's really something I'm learning. Um, as I say, I think there are some things where it's kind of accepted that the junior will have a first go at. Um, but also, I mean, I mean, it's also a learning process for me, really, um, as to see how to kind of, I mean, it also depends on which junior, let's put it this way, because for um, the most confident one, then I may be able to give them the whole thing and have a stab and try and try it. Um, but if it's someone really, really junior and they may need a bit more guidance, I may need to pick out some issues um, for them to and help them break it down and, and help them prioritize um, which parts to do. Sure, sure. Before we began, you mentioned that you have in September a 40 day trial, 40 day uh, negligence trial, which sounds exceptionally imposing. 
um, not, re not related to an issue like that, um, when, when you um, handle a number of briefs uh, simultaneously, what are the things that you consider when you schedule your court dates? Um, in terms of scheduling court dates, it really is a matter of simply making sure it really doesn't clash. And so my secretary is um, immensely helpful um, in managing that. And sometimes because different solicitors may take my diary, my available dates to go and fix at the court on the same day. And so there's, there is sometimes actually the potential for a clash. So what we do is ask them to call us from court before they really fix it. So the clerk at a court will offer right. some dates, et cetera. And so we always ask them to double check with my secretary on the spot um, to minimize any possibilities of clashing. And so far, I've been fortunate enough to not have a clash. Okay, <laughs> that's very good to hear. Now, uh, Queenie, um, uh, one part of this, uh, this session is to do uh, deals with uh, stress and stress management, yeah. uh, which is uh, something that, um, that, that many advocates have to uh, very often contend with, particularly when you have a number of cases running simultaneously. Uh, yeah. What do you think are the main steps that advocates can take to prevent uh, instances of stress uh, when preparing for or handling a brief? I think, um, you know, just as when people talk about property, they always talk about location, location and location. I think for an advocate, I would say preparation, preparation and preparation. I think that really is um, just so important, uh, like planning ahead, um, uh, thinking ahead as to what questions the judge may ask me, for example, um, to try and minimize the chance of my being taken by surprise at a hearing. I think that really helps. Um, for me personally, I also tend to make a lot of notes, um, both in terms of uh, in, for my oral submissions and also for my cross-examination. Now, I may or may not end up using it all, but um, as a person who kind of may feel nervous about all these hearings, um, it just helps me to have it all written down and it helps me to have made sure I've really thought it through once at least. And then um, on the spot, you know, if my mind goes blank, at least I have all these notes and I have something to look at to help jog my memory. Because I, I think the reality is that however much we remember normally, et cetera, sometimes um, under pressure, our mind sometimes really does just go blank. And so for me, it's just helpful to have all those notes. Right. Um, have you ever encountered a, a, an instance in your practice where um, you have uh, suffered burnout, for one for, a, for, for, for one for a better term, a burnout, um, and if you have encountered such an instance before, uh, how did you uh, overcome or how did you handle that situation? Um, yes, definitely. Um, I think it's not easy to know how to say no, actually, to cases, especially because as a barrister, I'm self-employed. And so if I say no now, I don't know what's going to happen next week, for example. I may or may not get another chance um, for a new case next week. So I think that sometimes uh, means that we take on too many cases, uh, particularly when one is junior. I think um, I've had to learn to sometimes say no, um, which is, and um, part of it is about having the confidence and to know that I'm not going to starve, um, even if I say no to this uh, today and learning to have that um, confidence. Um, I think also as I move into different stages of my career, and for example, now I mentioned, um, I, I now often have someone junior helping me. And so that is helping a lot, I think. Um, so I think these things um, all help. Um. Sure. Now, uh, Queenie, if I can take you to a moment when you are just about to get on your feet, just before the start of a trial or a hearing, what are the steps that advocates can take to settle their nerves just before the beginning of the case? Um, for me, um, I mean, I think it sounds very sort of obvious perhaps, but I think for me, like getting there well ahead of time is helpful. Um, sometimes I see sort of people sort of rushing into the courtroom or something. And for me, it's just never a good start um, to the whole thing. Um, so I think having enough time and just to remember to continue breathing, <laughs> um, I, I think that that helps me. Um, I also like having a glass of water or a cup of water. So um, that can also be something, um, having a sip that can also help me uh, just kind of take a take a moment. Sure. Well, uh, one thing that, that I often um, contend with is struggling to kind of detach myself from a case. <laughs> uh, like you're continuously thinking about it even on the weekends and uh, particularly when a deadline is coming up, you're thinking whether you know, you've um, looked at the problem from 
every possible angle. Uh, do, do you find it difficult to detach yourself from your cases? I have to say I'm relatively fortunate. Um, I think I find it easier than most people to detach myself. So when I go out for meals with family and friends, um, usually I can sort of leave my case there and um, not keep thinking about it. Um, I think it is harder for some people. I mean, some friends do tell me, you know, even when they're like having a shower or something, that they're just thinking about it. But I think for me, I, I try to separate out um, sort of work and the other aspects of my life. I think that's one of the reasons why I try not to really work from home too much. I mean, it's difficult, with, especially with COVID for many people. Um, but for me, I tend to try and sort of physically keep these things um, separate to try and help me with that. Right. And, and would you be able to tell us how, how you've been able to successfully detach yourself from your briefs often? Um, I think, I think um, it's really learning to focus on what I'm doing at that particular time. So if I'm having a meal with uh, my parents or, or my friends, etc., to really just simply focus on what the other person is saying. Um, I think partly is because I want them to feel um, important. And so I really want to listen. And if I'm busy listening to them, then that sort of occupies my mind. And then I don't need to, um, or I'm less sort of likely to kind of start thinking about my case again. Right, okay. Now, um, I would like to ask you something that I think a lot of our younger members of the firm would be interested in. Uh, do you think it is possible to strike a successful balance between having a social life and being an active litigation practice? <laughs> um, I think it's definitely not easy, and I think it's something many of us struggle with um, for a very long time. I have to say I continue to struggle with it uh, now. But I think um, one thing I've learned uh, is that one does need to have a social life. I, I think, I mean, it sounds very trite, but I think for the first few years of my practice, I really didn't go out very much for meals with family and friends. Um, and then after a few years, I mean, I, you were asking me earlier about burnout. Um, I think it was really at that point, I kind of thought, this is not sustainable. I can't keep you know, living my life with only going to work and, and not having meals, et cetera, et cetera. So I think um, obviously we all have to work hard, um, but I think it is important to remember also that we do need a social life um, as well. Um, I think one thing that I try to do um, is to have a no cancellation policy. So if I've uh, arranged a meal with somebody or arranged an activity, whatever it is, um, I try very, 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 very hard um, not to cancel. Um, I mean, if I suddenly need to do an injunction and it's really unavoidable, then very occasionally I may need to cancel. But, um, but I'm not going to cancel for something that really isn't a complete sort of disaster or, or sudden kind of thing. Um, and I think that helps uh, put a bit of discipline, if I can put it that, that way, um, for my social life and to make sure I don't just get sort of eaten up entirely um, by my work. Sure. Um, how often do you go on holidays? Um, well, it's difficult with COVID now. Um, <laughs> before COVID, I used to go um, at least once a year with my parents. Um, right. I tend to like spending time with them there, and partly because that's a sort of nice chunk of time to spend away um, from the office. Um, I, I might go uh, once more, perhaps with friends, um, just depends. But, but mainly, at least I would have one longish holiday um, with family. Right. And, and apart from that lengthy holiday, are you continuously working? <laughs> um, sadly, um, probably yes. <laughs> I mean, I'm still working toward, I, I'm, I'm not a good example for this, quite frankly. I'm a bit of a workaholic. Um, I mean, I'm still working towards trying to take uh, one day off a week. I have to say I'm still struggling with it to have a complete day away. I mean, sometimes it works and um, I would have to say the majority of the, the time it, it doesn't. Um, but that's what I'm trying to work towards. Um, so I am trying to sort of cut back a bit. Goodness me. So, so you, uh, you ordinarily work six days a week? Um, I, I usually work sort of six and a half, probably, I would say. So, so on Sunday mornings, I will go to church. But then um, in the afternoons, I will still often um, work. So I'm, I'm trying to see if I can take Sunday off in general. Um, but for example, this Sunday, I, I know I definitely can't because I'm, I'm actually working on an injunction at the moment. Um, so um, it's a bit of a busy time, but um, it's something I'm working towards um, continuously. <laughs> right. OK. Do you enjoy practice now as much as you presumably did when you first started? I really enjoy practice very, very much. Um, for me, it's definitely the right decision um, to be a barrister. I think the fact that I decided to try something else first uh, helped show me that this is really what suits me. And I think actually 
I have longer hours now than when I was at Slaughter in May. I mean, often people think that the hours are terrible at a Magic Circle firm, but actually I have to say, I don't think it was that bad at, at all um, at Slaughter's. And I would definitely say I'm working longer hours now, um, but I enjoy it and it's really something that suits me. So I, I don't mind as much, I think. Okay. And uh, I think this is a question I should perhaps have uh, begun with. Uh, what led you to uh, choosing uh, law as a career? Um, part of it is that, uh, part of it is sort of very sort of flippant and silly, but um, part of it is really just some, sometimes seeing these movies and, and films, which makes it look very fun and attractive. Um, at least the courtroom side of it, very um, sort of exciting as it were. So that is what sort of start, sparked my interest. Sure. And then I think on a slightly more serious note, um, I think I see law in so many different areas of life. And when you sort of open a newspaper, for example, and, and you read about sort of different things that are happening, um, so very often there's a legal aspect to things. And so I think that was um, something that attracted me. That's something that was very relevant, I felt. Sure. Sweeney, uh, those are all the questions I had. Um, I hope you don't mind if I maybe opened up the floor to the rest of the firm uh, to see if they had any questions of their own. Please. So please, if anyone had a question for Queenie, please do feel free to pose it. Or if any of you have any thoughts on um, what Greg was asking me, please also <laughs> yeah. feel free to share as well. Yeah. Actually, whilst you were speaking, Queenie, I won't, I won't mention who it is, but someone texted me to say one or two holidays a year, I'm ashamed. <laughs> <laughs> ashamed of, his, of, of, of himself. <laughs> no, I think it's great if you can um, sort of take more holidays. And, and to be honest, I think it's slightly different because I, I think you guys are employed right, in a law firm, so it's slightly different. So when I was at Slaughter right. in May, I would take all my, you know, however many days of holiday I had. Um, but now that I'm self-employed, because if you think about it, because I'm self-employed, if I if I go on holiday, I have to keep paying rent for my room. So this is my office now. I have right. to um, pay for the holiday um, and I have to not be able to earn. <laughs> so right. it's a kind of, quite a big kind of step, if I can put it sure. that way. Sure. And, and as a barrister, presumably you had a lot of control as to your time, isn't it? Or, or do you <laughs> find that that's the case or...? That's a theory, I think. Um, I but see. in reality, I think it's harder because the, the good thing about working at a law firm is that, for example, if you go on holiday, um, as I understand it, often you can ask uh, the person next door right. um, help yeah. look after a case or something like that. But for barristers, it doesn't really work like that. Okay. So it may be that the more junior person can help look after the case. Um, but you can't sort of hand it off to another barrister, basically, to babysit. Because everyone is sort of separate. We're, we're all our own little mini sort of um, sort of cells, as it were. Yes, Michelle, I see your hand is raised. You want to pose a question? Yeah, sure. Hi, I'm sorry I'm driving, so it may be a bit noisy around me. Okay, no be worries. careful. Yeah, no worries. It's on a thingy. But I just wanted to ask, like you were talking about how um, barristers have a bit more, uh, like when it comes to holidays and stuff, maybe because we're in a law firm, we can hand it off to someone else to do the job. But then, as, especially like I would say in our firm, we have our own cases and we have to manage our own cases. So it's kind of like even when we're on holiday or when we're on MC, when we're on leave, we still need to kind of like attend to the work which we need to attend to. Right. So how do, you, how do you manage this and the stress that comes with this? Oh, oh that's interesting. I didn't realise um, you guys don't sort of have as much, have as much sort of covering for each other as um, maybe some uh, situations. Um, so actually, I think your situation is very similar to mine, um, Michelle. I, I think, um, I mean, obviously when I pick the dates for a holiday, mm -hmm. then I will try and pick dates that I already know, um, you know, I won't have a sort of massive hearing around that time or just after it. So I'll try and leave some buffer space and time um, before hearing and, and not sort of cut it too fine. I will also try to definitely decline new cases just before a holiday because I definitely don't want to be sort of taking a new case with me. Um, and then for existing cases, you may not be able to control um, realistically as to whether some disaster is going to happen when you're away. But um, 
I, I hope very much that these disasters will not happen too often. Um, but if I really do need to do some work, I try to do it in the mornings and then at night um, so that I can still go out uh, on holiday and enjoy um, the trip uh, during the day. Um, so that's what I try to do. Um, but it's easier said than done. <laughs> Okay. Okay. Thank you. That's helpful. Thanks, Michelle. Thanks, Michelle. So, does anyone else have a <coughs> have a question? Queen, Queenie, when when working in a team uh, with, with with other barristers, do you do you um, only do that within chambers, or do you sometimes work with barristers from other chambers as well? Um, it's not exclusively within my chambers, but definitely by far um, the most would be within my chambers. Um, I think sometimes because we're all individuals, um, sort of individual mini businesses, as it were, there's no sort of rule that it has to be within chambers, but it's it's just more convenient, actually. Um, so sort of physically and you can just walk next door to talk to the person, etc. And I think it also helps when we know each other well and we know how um, we like to work and what we sort of expect from each other, um, that sort of thing. Um, but in particular in Hong Kong, um, there's a, a very well-known um, barrister, senior counsel, um, who's on his own, for example, um, like Benjamin USC. And so he works with many of uh, us in our chambers. So for example, the injunction I'm working on at the moment um, is with him. Um, so we work uh, most frequently with him outside chambers. Sure. Prashant, do you have your hand Race, please post your question. Hopefully you're not driving as well. <laughs> I'm still in the office. Okay. Uh, am I like audible? Yes. yes, you are. You are. Go ahead. Okay, cool. Um, so I just started working um like two months ago. So like you know, there's a lot of like apprehension about um a lot of things. So I just I guess I wanted to ask you, like, in terms of like if you remember how you felt when you were just starting out, like presenting in front of a judge and stuff like that, like what what were the things that you did in order to like kind of get over that sense of like, you know, apprehension? Yeah, yeah I, I think definitely um, at the start, I was particularly nervous. I mean, I think many of us are nervous sort of even throughout our careers to some extent uh, where we appear before judges. But I think certainly at the beginning it's most um, nerve wracking just because we haven't had the chance to do it very much. Um, I think some of the practical things I did was someone told me, for example, I mean, just taking me, for example, I speak very, very fast normally. And so when I used to do notes, et cetera, for my oral submissions, um, especially in the first uh, sort of few months, et cetera, I would write a slow kind of all over my notes um, to remind myself because, I mean, I'll, I'll kind of remember it before the hearing starts, but I know that as I go along, um, I may get swept up and sort of get more and more excited. And, and so I, I kind of sort of, I, I think the long and short of it is that I have to kind of look at myself and see um, what are the particular things I need to deal with and then try and address those things. So for me, it's, for example, um, speed, et cetera. Um, so nowadays, I don't need to. So for today, I, did, I didn't have to put a <laughs> sign for myself saying slow um, after having sort of done this kind of for a little while. Um, but um, but certainly at the beginning, I find that kind of thing particularly helpful. Right. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks, Prashant. Hi, David. Yes, go ahead. Hi. Uh, hi, Queenie. I, I, I was the one who sent uh, Greg, Greg that text. <laughs> <laughs> it is said that uh, David is on holiday. When he wants to take a break, he comes to work. Uh, <laughs> But no, I just wanted to ask, um, uh, you know, throughout your practice, have, have there been periods where you um, you get really frustrated or disillusioned, maybe with a decision or with um, a client? And, and, and if so, in, in those circumstances, um, how, how do you pull yourself out of that um, mindset or, or frustration? Yeah, there are certainly times when um, we may feel a decision is, is just so wrong uh, or we don't understand it. Um, and actually once, for example, there was a case where uh, we won at first instance and then we won um, before the Court of Appeal, before three very strong judges, including one who became a Court of Final Appeal judge. So really a very strong judge. And then suddenly in the Court of Final Appeal, we lost um, on a point that the other side had not raised and um, that it was one of the judges who suddenly came up with. 
And so, so for example, I mean, that case, you know, I really did feel very aggrieved. Um, and I felt that it was uh, very, very sort of unfair, unfortunate and all that. Um, I mean, I think there are several things. Um, I think first that taught me really there is litigation risk. However much you know, we think that our case is strong and actually however much um, you know, other people just, uh, sort of agree with us actually at the first two levels, um, there's still that. Um, but I think for that case, I was also very relieved that um, despite, for example, our having won those two sort of first levels, um, as it were, when the other side had approached us for possible settlement, um, my solicitors still did say, oh, please do think about it and did advise them to consider it. Um, so I think sometimes these disappointments also um, help me as I sort of mature, I guess, um, kind of realize that actually I can't just kind of take my view and then sort of run with it kind of thing. I need to think about different possibilities and, and that sort of um, bigger picture kind of um, frame of mind, I guess. And I think um, in terms of how to get over disappointment, um, I think I would say that for me, it's slightly easier that I do civil cases, I feel, as opposed to criminal, because often for civil cases, it's about money. Um, I mean, occasionally it's about someone's like only house, for example, and then there's much more pressure. Um, but um, but often, often it's about money. So it's not the end of the world. I mean, obviously, no one would want to lose money, you know, unless they have to. Um, but it is, it's slightly uh, less serious, it would seem to me, than sort of actually losing one's liberty. Um, so I think um, also by the choice of uh, area, uh, as a practice area, I think um, that helps me a bit as well. All right. Thank you. Thanks very much. Thanks, David. Jen, you have put your hand up twice. Oh, sorry. I think that might have been an accident. I just have one sorry. question. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It just um, means you, you are second in the queue. Go ahead, Jen. Sorry. Yes. Hi. Um, I just wanted hi. to ask whether, uh, Miss Queen, have you ever felt burnt out? And if you have, uh, what are your like go to solutions? And how, how do you manage that? Um, I, I think it's going slightly back to uh, back to what I was saying earlier, um, having to make sure that I do maintain some sort of social life. I think often when I feel most burnt out, it's when I'm just really spending ridiculous amounts of time in the office and really not sort of leaving the office to go and do anything fun. So I think making it a point and having the discipline um, to say I am going to go out um, and have meals and do different activities, go for a hike, whatever. Um, and take a break. Um, I, I think that really helps. I mean, maybe there's sometimes, to be honest, after dinner, I may need to do a bit more work still, but still I won't cancel on the dinner um, if I you know, can help it at all. Because I think taking that step away and, and just kind of having a break um, is something that will help me um, to recalibrate myself. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks very much. Yep, Jace, go ahead. Hi, Queenie. Hi. Hi, uh, my name is Jace. I just have a very quick question. I oh. think bearing in mind that um, the the work that lawyers do is very fast paced and we're constantly required to be on the ball and on top of things, right? Uh, do you think lawyers have somehow just been, you know, We've, we've somehow become accustomed to this culture and this lifestyle that we find that it's normal. Or are you of the opinion that this is something that could potentially be a little unhealthy that requires some form of change or reform? Um, I, I can't say I can really speak on a sort of very general level. Um, I can't say I'm very familiar with sort of the general legal market, as it were. Um, I mean, what I can say, for example, like a place in Hong Kong where I'm based, I think many of us um, are sort of, in a sort of fast paced type of work, I guess. Um, and I guess the thing is that even if everyone around us is like that, um, we still need to make a personal choice as to how to manage it um, for ourselves. I think the reality um, is that we have to work hard. I think we can't get away from that. But I think we can uh, sort of see how to balance it out a little bit more. Um, I mean, for example, even in my chambers, uh, some people will actually quite frankly be better at at it than me um, in terms of leaving the office at weekends or just not coming back and just not doing it. And to be honest, the sky doesn't fall down. Um, I, I, to be honest, I, I don't quite know how they do it. I mean, I think, I think possibly they may take on fewer cases and that sort of thing, but, um, but there are ways to kind of try and do it. So to some extent, I think it's a personal decision. Um, 
And I think each person's working style is also something that affects it. Um, for example, for me, um, I know a lot of solicitors say that I tend to be very responsive um, on email, for example. So there's a good, it's a good thing and bad thing. I mean, it's a good thing from the, for the solicitor because then they know that you know, their email hasn't gone into some deep dark hole. Um, but I also know that it's a, a sort of potentially a bad thing for me because it means I'm sort of responding all the time. Um, so there will be some times at weekends when I go out, I'll just make it a point to not keep looking at my phone and not keep checking my email. So for example, if I'm having dinner, et cetera, I will try very hard not to keep looking at my phone and answering emails because otherwise I, I can't really sort of manage dinner. So I think even within the fast paced um, sort of lifestyle, perhaps, that many lawyers have, um, I think there are these snippets that we can try and adopt to try and help ourselves a little bit. Thanks, Queen. Thank you. Yeah, Queenie, that, that's fantastic advice. And just kind of keep away your phone. <laughs> actually in, you know, having like a bit of social, like, you know, personal time. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe now that everything is linked to your phone, isn't it? Yeah. So, uh, exactly. Queenie, I, I just had another question. Um, oh. what, one of the um, greatest fears of, of an advocate is um, when you're on your feet and you ask the question um, by the judge and you don't quite know the answer to it. Now, um, in instances like that, um, how do you deal with managing the stress that that uh, goes along with that? When, when you're preparing for a case and you're a bit anxious about being asked a question that you don't quite know the answer to, how do you manage that particular type of stress? It is very difficult. Um, I think I probably can't say very much more than to really emphasize the importance of preparation um, again. Um, and really trying very, very hard um, to think ahead as to what might happen and what might be asked. And I think I suppose um, part of that is also knowing the papers very, very well, because the questions from from the judge is usually not going to be something completely sort of plucked out of the air. Um, so at least even if I don't know the exact answer right away, hopefully I can sort of understand or think about why they're asking it. Is it arising from a particular document? Um, and then hopefully, um, once I can sort of start looking at the document, um, partly that will buy me a little bit of time as I kind of start reading the document to the court or whatever. Um, but also, it, hopefully, it can help help me identify um, what it is that actually the judge is getting at. Um, I think it's, it's more about buying a little bit of time like, well, when it really happens. And if there's a question I don't know how to answer. How to buy some time without looking completely silly and, and sort of... Um, sort of disorganized um, and then trying to really in those few seconds um, try to find something to say and hopefully the answer. Sure. Thank you so much, Queenie. Thanks so much for having me.